This is really exciting to be back on stage at Creative Mornings. Uh, it's really exciting to see that it's going forward. Um, that, that it's moving forward really strongly with Taylor at the helm. It's so exciting to see CAM still be the venue for it and to have so much support from all of the initial sponsors. Uh, it means a lot to come back as well. Taylor kept kind of knocking on my door, and I was like, ah, I'm, I have a lot going on, I have a lot going on, and finally I was like, okay, okay, let's, I, I think it's time. So I'm really excited to be back here. Uh, to, to just kind of kick things off, I wanted to just talk a little bit about myself, where I came from, and then I'll talk about where Creative Mo Mornings came from, and then, whoop, whoop, whoop. <laughs> was that happening before? Okay. Um, so I was born in 1982 in Vermont. I lived in Hartford, Connecticut through high school. I went to college in Richmond, go spiders. Uh, while I was there, I had an opportunity to live in Copenhagen, Denmark uh, for six months. <laughs> uh, after I graduated, I waited tables in, in Washington, D.C., living in my friend's kitchen. Uh, I then went out to Wyoming to work on a dude ranch. If anyone's seen Hey Dude, that's exactly what I was part of. Uh, it was pretty amazing. I moved back to Richmond to wait tables and work as a bank teller uh, as I kind of figured out what was happening in life and, uh, and ended up realizing that I wanted to go to grad school for landscape architecture, which headed me to NC State College of Design here in Raleigh. So that was in 2007. Uh, while I was in grad school, I decided that I wanted to continue school, so I ended up going out to UNC for, at Chapel Hill for city and regional planning, and, uh, and then came back here after a, sh a quick year in Carborough, and I've been here ever since. So, Creative Mornings Raleigh. Oh, I wonder if I should time out. Um, this wasn't happening before. It wasn't happening for you, was it? Am I just, am I just, okay, well, sorry if that, if I keep hitting it. Um, so, <clears throat> it happened actually about in November 2011 was the inception. It was, I had uh, recently held a Kickstarter project for uh, City Fabric to launch a line of t-shirts, and I had this opportunity to meet all these interesting people in Raleigh these different creatives, entrepreneurs, business folks, community leaders, um, artists, and I didn't have that opportunity to meet all these different people while I was in school, but I was starting to meet them through this project and kind of putting myself out there a little bit more publicly. And I realized that there was an amazing community in Raleigh, and I started to figure out how I could connect with more people that were part of that community. And I would kind of been learning, of, I, I read this blog, Swiss Miss, which is out of Brooklyn, and she started this little speaker series. She got her friends together in Brooklyn and w had each other share what they were working on. And, and so, uh, little did she know that other cities would want to kind of replicate that, and they loved the kind of brand and identity that she created. And so I had kind of been watching this from afar, and she started to create a little bit of a package and handbook to help people start chapters. And it seemed to me uh, that this could be something that R Raleigh could really use. It could connect all these little dots, all these disparate parts, um, and bring people together for an hour and a half a month uh, to, sh to listen to amazing people and interesting things in the community. And that it was diverse, and it wasn't limited to business or wasn't limited to art. It was open. It was just kind of creative, anything from tech to, you know, book publishers. So, uh, so I, I actually admittedly came home one night kind of juked off of a public event where they had a little bit of beer and, and I just got kind of excited and wrote an email and to headquarters and said, hey guys, I think Raleigh's prime, Raleigh and the Triangle's prime for this. 
And I received an email about a month later. I was a, uh, a little overwhelmed at the time. And we ended up uh, hopping on the phone uh, in February, uh, February, March, uh, about three or four months after I wrote that initial email. I spoke with Kevin and then Tina, who's Swiss Miss. And it, it went off really well. They, we, we hit it off. I was fairly energetic, uh, talked really fast, kind of like I'm doing right now. And, and, uh, and they loved it. They said, yes, Matt, let's do this. And so over the following five to six months, I uh, reached out to many of the people that I had met through this Kickstarter project and through City Fabric and, and started to ask people to kind of join and, and to be a part of it. And so what's been really awesome is that much of that team has remained from the beginning. And, um, and it's so exciting to see where, where, it, um, where it's at now. So, so I hope that everyone who's new will come back. And I'm really excited to see so many people returning. So now, a little bit about me, some background. This was actually uh, the first business that I had. I grew up drawing uh, as an artist and doing all sorts of random stuff in school, but I never knew what design was. I never knew what I was interested in really, but I love to draw golf courses. I love to draw landscapes. I love to draw houses. I took art lessons, um, but I never really moved past like an art or drawing class in high school or college. But this was actually the first, uh, the first foray into kind of selling my work. Fast forward <coughs> to undergrad, I had the opportunity to live in Copenhagen, Denmark. Um, Copenhagen is very unique. People bike a lot. There's a lot of different types of transit. I'd never really experienced anything like this before. It was, it was quite a formidable part or moment of my life. It, so many people say you go live overseas and it changes your life and it seems so cliche, but my gosh, it's like when you live 40 minutes outside of a city ride a kilometer and a half to a train station that you can set your watch to, get off in downtown and walk to school and see a lot of people at every leg of that trip, it changes you. And so this, this was actually the square that was right near my school. You know, there's, there's landmarks, there's public, public spaces, there's markets. It was, it was really fantastic place to be. And I went there to study architecture. I was in school uh, for business at University of Richmond and I always, I, you know, my kind of arts background kept creeping up, kept creeping up, and I thought that it was architecture that I was interested in. So I went to this program that wasn't sanctioned by Richmond uh, to see if that was what I wanted. It was rigorous. It was really exciting. Um, I loved it, and I got to see a bunch of awesome architecture across Europe, but I realized that it wasn't really the buildings that I, that I was that interested in. I realized that it was the space between the buildings. It was the people. It was the energy, it was all of the different layers that make a city tick. And that's what I was really interested in. But I still didn't know, okay, was that architecture? What, what is that? And when I came back home, I looked at my world differently. I looked at my neighborhood differently. I started asking myself more questions, becoming a little bit more curious, and observed why is this place so different? And I came to this conclusion that people have really been designed out of our places. Um, that where I grew up, uh, in outside Hartford, Connecticut, for the most part, people were designed out of it. Choices to travel and to be active in different ways were designed out of it. So I just started asking myself questions and started doing some research uh, into who studies this. You know, what, where, where can I go that's a little bit in the design world? I really loved architecture, but how do I design the public spaces, the places where people convene and interact and engage? So from there, I learned about landscape architecture. I learned about sorry, um, urban planning, and, and a few other allied professions, and started to be really interested in the systems, the economic, social, environmental systems that really help shape healthy, safe, enjoyable places for people to thrive. And that's kind of what uh, I've landed on as my mission. That's kind of all of my projects that I work on, whether it's t-shirts, whether it's signs, whether it's posters, banners, or this talk. It's, this, is, this is what my mission is. So I went to grad school. I, studied these spaces between buildings, started to learn about how to act, activate these spaces, how to make them more welcoming and safe for kids, for families, for grandparents to age in place with their grandchildren. I entered competitions while in school. This was, the actual name of this submission was Burp the Burb. It was a, it was a suburban design competition um, to relocate to uh, schools in downtown Long Island Center. 
And the idea was BURP was build urban relationships for people. So starting to explore how you can reorganize the different systems and re-engage people about um, how they move from place to place. And this is an example of another design competition that, that I did. And come on, Sig. <laughs> Sig Hutchinson, everybody. <laughs> Um, and so, so I really enjoyed school. I started to learn how to communicate through imagery, how to tell a, a rich story about what could be possible through imagery, through visuals, through diagrams. But I started to realize that it was so hard for me to talk about what I was doing in school to my parents, to my friends. It was really difficult for me to kind of articulate everything that I had learned, the different tools that I had grasped and why I was doing what I was doing. So over a summer when no inter internships were available, um, I started to test and tinker with a friend of mine. Started to play around with different tools that we used in school to communicate and see if we could kind of use them to tell stories to our friends, to our family, um, in, a, in a little bit simpler, easier to grasp way. And so we landed on this. This is called a Noli map. This was actually the first uh, kind of engineered map and it it depicts all of the buildings and act a, as a mass and then the void is all the space between the buildings it was the first time that maps had kind of been turned from bird's eye illustrative that you see a lot of historic maps to overhead and so it was Gian Battista Noli who was the first guy to do this he actually went out and measured the entire city and so it was actually to scale and we use these to kind of study the urban environment, to study the buildings while in school for landscape architecture and urban planning. And, and realize that it's a really beautiful map. This is one for Raleigh. It's a little bit unique. Typically you see roads and streets and, and rivers, but here the, you, all you see is the buildings and it's this kind of constellation of shapes and it's really unique. And you start to actually be able to read the history of the city. You can start to see the more historic grid, and then you can see where other or newer neighborhoods come in around the top and where there's larger development. And so it's a it's really interesting uh, way to talk about a city and a story. And we started showing this to people, and they loved it. They didn't recognize it at first, but then once we started telling these stories, they loved it. So we decided to uh, a very low barrier to entry product. Let's say, let's make a few t-shirts, slap it on the t-shirt, and try and tell Raleigh's story through a t-shirt. We went to a local arts market in downtown Raleigh. It was actually the first local arts market that was held uh, in front of the Morning Times down there on Hargett Street. And we didn't really know what we were doing. Let's spend five or six hundred bucks and, uh, and let's see what happens. Let's talk to people. Let's see if people like this. And so through that, uh, we ended up doubling our money and and we had a blast. We talked to people for three or four hours. We had a Philly shirt. Raleigh's actually based off of Philly's plan. It had the state house in the middle and then the four parks at either quadrant. Uh, you know, we filled a few of those in right uh, since then. But it was still, regardless, it was really fun to talk about where Raleigh came from and use that as a way to talk about where Raleigh could go. And also to mention the space between the buildings, it's, it, it really acted as a tool to start to talk about the opportunities that there are in Raleigh, which I'll show in a little bit, uh, a little bit more time. But uh, that kind of you know, got us excited. It, it got us uh, interested in, oh, wow, wow, could we actually sell stuff? I was still in grad school. Um, I'd never thought about making a product or doing anything like that. So I guess it was uh, being oblivious to risk was on my side. And, um, and, and so over the next eight months, we started tinkering, trying to figure out how to source products, what e-commerce was. This was in 2011, and it's amazing how just in two and a half years, how different the online software offerings to sell things and to source things has changed. It's so amazing. Um, so back at that time, I had heard about this thing called Kickstarter. Has every, every, everyone familiar with Kickstarter at this point, for the most part? So back then, no one knew it. No, no one knew about it. And um, again, I, I, I had heard about it through, through Swiss Miss, and it was this all or nothing funding platform. This idea of reaching out to the crowd, you know, having a whole bunch of random people you don't know, 
send you money to do something that you say you're going to try and do and that you can't even promise that you'll deliver. And this seems so amazing to me. And so I decided to give it a whirl. I was still in grad school. It's like if I'm going to commit, then I'm going to commit and I just want to fail, you know, big or, uh, or actually be able to do it. So created a little video uh, with a friend, Nick, who actually started out doing video uh, for Creative Mornings. He's now in Charlotte. But, uh, but he, he helped me with a fun little video that kind of told the story of what we had done in Raleigh and how people were, were enjoying it and just threw it up on, on Kickstarter and used it as a way to kind of share the story and share the message of what we were trying to do. And we were blown away. We almost tripled our goal and this was one of the highest funded projects um, at the time when because when, Kickstarter was still so new. But it also forced us into this uh, this very, very uh, uncomfortable situation of having to fulfill about 2,000 shipments in about two or three months, which I'd never done. So it was a serious crash course in learning, doing, using kind of creative problem solving and design thinking that I was learning in school, but to sell t-shirts, which was really interesting. Um, but by December of that year, I'd launched an e-commerce store uh, with the excess inventory that I had created from, uh, from the Kickstarter project. And I realized, you know, I was still in school, this isn't, this isn't why I went to school. I didn't go to school to sell t-shirts. And so I kind of re-engaged in uh, the College of Design community and, and started to kind of explore what else was going on out there. Um, you know, so many people started reaching out because of that project. A lot of people in allied professions started reaching out because of that project. And I, I realized that some, some students at State were talking about doing this project called Parking Day. Um, they, were, they were in the College of Design, and Parking Day is basically creating a small little temporary park for one day in a parking space. It started about five years ago in San Francisco when a couple guys uh, re kind of recognized that they didn't have a park that was close by in their neighborhood. So they decided to roll out some astro, not astro turf, some actual turf in a parking space, hang out in it like a park, and feed the meter for a day. It got a lot of attention. They created a little handbook, and people started replicating it. I saw this, I was like, man, that's amazing. Like, that's so cool. Uh, first, to connect with people like this, and two, that people are actually doing something like this. So people at school were talking about doing this, but I was like, well, Raleigh's a little different than San Francisco. Um, <laughs> you know, I know, I've been to San Francisco. There's a lot of people who live close together in San Francisco. People don't live too close together in Raleigh, so is there actually going to be an audience for this? And, and kind of decided that there wasn't going to be an audience, and that maybe this wasn't the best project for Raleigh at this moment. And, and that, hey, maybe we need some people to kind of activate and uh, activate the space before something like Parking Day could happen. So, so that's kind of where this idea to, to re-engage the Raleigh community with, it, with the idea that it's not too far to walk in Raleigh. So I started asking people, you know, why don't you walk? Why don't you walk? I, I, I lived kind of at the north end of Glenwood South, and I'd walk places, but I wouldn't see anyone. So uh, some friends and I just started asking questions. Why don't, why don't you walk anywhere? Or, or do you walk? Do you walk? No, no, it's too far. It's too far. And we hopped on Google Maps and used Google Maps Walk and realized, man, it really isn't too far to walk in Raleigh. You know, it, there are a lot of things that are within a 15 or 25 minute walk, which now that might be long for a quick meeting, but if you're going to the store, a 20 minute walk isn't that bad. And so, <clears throat> after brainstorming with a friend and kind of uh, having some time over winter break after calming down after uh, the holiday season with City Fabric, um, kind of in light of the parking, the the parking day installation, I was like, man, I like this idea. This is kind of like a tactic. This is like a citizen initiated project that's thoughtful and isn't necessarily breaking any rules. And so we decided to make some signs. We decided to say, hey, if people think it's too far, let's kind of try and shift that perception. Shift information. Simple language that they know, that they recognize on the street and just say, hey, it's not too far. We're not going to tell people to do it. We're not going to force people to do it. We're going to use a simple common language of signing and make sure that we strap it. We don't use adhesive. We don't want to disrupt anything or be malicious. Um, and to use metrics that are human scale. 
minutes versus miles. We, we actually added color to the signs that kind of mimic highway signs. Uh, if, if you've been on a highway, you, re you, you notice that there are different colored signs based off the type of use of destination. So that was kind of the same reason. Based off the type of use. Uh, we directed you in the direction that you should walk, and then we added a little, a little tech widget there. It's called a QR code. It's a glorified barcode where we hopped on Google Maps and created w curated walking routes. And, uh, and these QR codes popped out, and we kind of pasted them onto onto the sign so that people with a smartphone could scan it and then get directions and we could track it. So we have a little bit of kind of quantification and uh, post evaluation of how these signs at would actually perform. Uh, we put them under the cover of darkness. It was, uh, it was fun. It was in the rain and actually a police officer even walked by and asked us what we were doing and we said, well, we're hanging walking signs. And he nodded and kept going. So. Um, <laughs> So, you know, we, we wanted to keep it simple. We wanted to be intentional and thoughtful about how we did this. And we wanted to make sure that anyone who came across these signs or questioned them had a way to get in touch. So we had a little URL that linked to a Facebook page that just said, hey, we installed these signs because we think it's not too far to walk places in Raleigh. Uh, it's kind of a, a public service for the community. If you like it, like the page. If you don't, leave a comment, tell us why, or call Matt at this number. And Funny enough, the, a couple citizens started to like it. It started to get spread around Facebook a little bit. And, and actually, a citizen, Andy Little, who works at SAS, loved it so much that he, he actually responded to an Atlantic article about wayfinding. So wayfinding is something that is delivered as a service by cities to help people acclimate where they are and get from point A to point B. Typically, they're kind of auto-oriented. Auto they're not typically p pedestrian oriented for the most part. But they take years to plan and millions of dollars to make and install. And so this article was just about how expensive it was to simply provide directions around town um, for people. And so he responded and she loved it. And so she covered, she basically wrote about it without telling me and put it on the front page of the Atlantic Cities and said, Gorilla Wayfinding in Raleigh. You know, citizen instigated um, public service to help people realize and, and shift perceptions that, it's, that it is okay to walk in Raleigh. And so that was kind of the first tipping point for Walk Raleigh. It was a, it was a really kind of pivotal moment because that attracted the attention of BBC News. And I'd later find out that BBC News uh, hadn't covered a story in North Carolina in over two years. So it was really interesting that this was something that caught their attention. Um, little did I know that that would really send a kind of a thunderstruck through downtown and through the Raleigh and even North Carolina community um, about this project. But when BBC News told me that they were coming to town, they said, well, you're not going to have much notice and, you know, be ready to go. And so they contacted me at about 10 p.m. The, the, the day before they were showing up at 8 a.m. And I was a little hesitant to just have this production made and tell this story without maybe letting the city know. Um, I, I had found out that the city was trying to figure out what department had actually installed them because they were fairly <laughs> professional looking. Um, but I, I had recently grown fond of Twitter and I, I am still to this day think it's an amazing resource and asset to connect with people and to gain knowledge and information. And so I actually tweeted at Raleigh's planning and development team. Uh, I'd met him once. Uh, I followed him online. I knew that he was really involved and engaged on Twitter. And Twitter, you know, you, your pocket buzzes when, you, when someone acknowledges you. And uh, he was still fairly new. He, was, he had just become the American Planning Association's president. So he still wasn't in the limelight as much as he is right now. So I tweeted at him and said, hey, Mitchell, any interest in talking to you at BBC News tomorrow? And uh, he replied within an hour. It was pretty amazing. He later told me that there was no way he would have ever responded if I had emailed him. So it's like these little, all these little things that are accessible and available and helping people connect right now that, that make unique experiences like this to, um, and the shareability of this and, and opportunity creation is just, it, it's so unique right now. 
But what the BBC article did was, which included Mitchell, which was a huge win uh, for the project, um, is that it actually forced the project to do It constituted, uh, you know, media started reaching out and asking if the city had installed it. They said no. And since they said no, they said, why is it still up? So they had to take it down. Uh, the community kind of rallied around it. And so did the planning department. The planning department said, hey, this is awesome. Like, this isn't malicious. This, is, isn't, this is for the greater good. We, we need to figure out a way to make this work. So they figured out how it tied into the Raleigh Comprehensive 2030 plan. And I kind of said that I'd do my part, and I'd show the support from the community. So I use signon.org. Again, another free kind of platform tool that's out there. And just Facebook, sent a Facebook post and said, hey, you guys, Raleigh, if you want to help restore this Walk Raleigh project, you know, sign on. And it circulated, and we only had three days before the city council meeting that would vote it in or vote it out. And uh, we raised close to 1,300 signatures in three days, which I was blown away by. It was really exciting. So we delivered a 128-page PDF to city council that morning. <clears throat> and it was unanimously voted in as a pilot educational program for the city in accordance to everything from safety to health, wellness, and accessibility measures that the city is committed to. About at this time, since so many other folks started reaching out, I started to learn about all these other projects that were kind of like Walk Raleigh that people were doing all over the country and all over the country. It was amazing. People were putting stickers on dilapidated buildings in New Orleans to ask what they want there. Uh, people were retrofitting you know, old telephone booths with public libraries in New York. In LA, people have been guerrilla gardening for 20, 30 years. People were yarn bombing things. You know, they, it's, it's a little bit more artsy, but it's like there's, there, there's a whole bunch up and down Glenwood right now. Um, people were actually, I mean, people were taking to the streets and kind of reclaiming public space. And I, all of this kind of came at me at once, and I was like, man, this is, this is cool. You know, this is, this is really cool. People were spray painting temporary bike sharrows in the, in the street. I was like, really? People care this much? I was like, there's a whole community of people out there who are, who are like-minded and, and think that we can move things forward. And so, so all these different projects started popping up. This is called Better Block. Uh, some guys in Texas actually attempted to break every code <laughs> rule for a city block. And it was amazing. They, they, they basically recreated what I, what I remember as the, the city plaza that was in Copenhagen. They basically seen that and been inspired in the same way. So they brought out street trees, they painted crosswalks, they had outdoor seating and dining and had markets, and they basically broke every single rule. And it, and it forced the city to reevaluate how they make decisions and how they program public space. So this really got me digging and searching into, wait, what is this? And so st they started to take all these different shapes and forms and had all these different titles. It was called Spontaneous Interventions, Do-It-Yourself Urbanism, User-Generated Urbanism, Tactical Urbanism. And what was amazing is it was all these different people. It was artists. It was entrepreneurs. It was business people. It was business owners. It was urbanists. It was, it was all sorts of people. And it was old and young. <clears throat> and so this kind of brought me back to Parking Day. And I learned that over the, the course of that kind of year since I had learned about Parking Day, that Parking Day had actually become formal policy. Parking Day had become parklets. So in San Francisco, you can actually buy the parking space that's in front of your shop and turn it into a public space. And so now there's 85 of them in San Francisco. Now, 85, you know, San Francisco is a little bit different of an environment from here. But still, this was pretty amazing. Um, it was actually written in to their code, and it, there is a formal way that you can go ahead and execute it over six to eight months. And what's exciting is that that has now spread across the country in literally a year or two. And so I believe that Raleigh has it on the docket to approve it as well. So looking at these other projects, they were kind of spreading all over the country, all over the world, kind of freely. And so many people were reaching out wanting to replicate these signs because of the pu publicity it had gotten and because people were so excited. So kind of, I was still in school at this point. I was like, what, the, what do I do? I have to finish my master's project. So I turned to my advisor and I go, can I share this? Can I drop what I'm doing right now and share this? 
And so, you know, why not respond to the demand and just see what happens? So again, turn to Kickstarter, reach out to the crowd, use it as a way to promote the story, tell the story, and see if people are willing to support it. This time, it was to create a template online that anyone could go online, kind of fill out, and download a sign. Really basic and simple. Wasn't really offering any real material products this time, so I didn't really know what would happen. But we almost doubled our goal. It was really exciting, got a whole bunch more press. Kickstarter supported it. And, uh, and, and really gave, gave me the confidence to, to at least move on to the next step. So we, thanks, see ya. Um, so we put the, the, the template up online and had a few support documents that helped tell the story and give parameters as to how to kind of deploy it. And people started doing it. People started downloading these templates and hanging them. It was kind of amazing, and they kept sharing it with us. They'd send us these emails. I get pictures from all over the place. This was actually out in California. It, it actually resonated across the globe. This is in Kiev. So you can see, like, and we opened it up under Creative Commons. We said, hack it, remix it, you know, make it your own. So these guys, you can see the resemblance, but they totally made it their own. And this is actually right near an aquarium, and it, it, the, the translation is, sharks beware of people. <laughs> which I thought was, you know, I th I, I, it, it was really fun. And I've actually had the ability to kind of learn from all of these different projects that are all over the place. This was in Miami. And they started just filtering in from all over the place. You can see how different they all are. Some are very close, some aren't. Um, even a group in, that was uh, trying to help people during Occupy Sandy uh, actually used it, which was really exciting. So. Everything that I had been reading about was true. I was experiencing it firsthand. And about at this time, this was, uh, I guess, December, December of 2012, January of 2013. And, uh, and there had been over 60 different cities and communities that had created this. Uh, I tried to, cr tried to make a map of, of it. I couldn't really keep up. And, um, and, but it was exciting, and it gave me more energy to move forward. And about at that time as well, the, the city of Raleigh, after the pilot program and after studying Walk Raleigh, they decided that they wanted to write it into their comprehensive pedestrian plan. So Walk Raleigh then, in January 2013, got voted in as actual policy as part of Raleigh's 2030 comprehensive plan. So it was amazing. What happened with the parklets actually happened with Walk Raleigh. And so because of that, and because some other communities reached out wanting to actually pay me to come to kind of deploy these or help their community deploy them, I was like, huh, maybe, maybe I should take another risk. Maybe we should take this to the next level, um, use, use a little bit of extra money that we had from the Kickstarter project, and evolve what that online template was. So we created a very simple template where in five clicks you can make a sign and download it uh, and have it manufactured. Uh, I use this initially as a tool for me. I, I needed it to help some of these communities, and it was a way to efficiently create a lot of signs and organize them and track how they performed. So as you can see, it still has a QR code. Not much is lost, but because of building it out on, on software, on the, we're able to kind of capture all the data and analytics, which I later found out cities have never really had that sort of information. They've never had the information um, that kind of describes how people interact with signage on the street or even might tell how they walk or where they walk. So again, this started the ball rolling again, started the opportunities kind of coming in the door. And so we decided to actually monetize it. We decided to say, hey, if you want to make signs and buy them off our site, we'll manufacture them for you. We got a channel partner, figured out how to kind of close that loop, and we'll also allow you to track how your signs do. So cities started buying them. Uh, we didn't do any press or publicity around this. It was, it's just kind of been organic, which has been amazing. Uh, a lot of it I, I attribute to the, the press uh, that it's gotten, and, and there's a number of national speakers who kind of use it as a precedent with Parking Day and some of these other projects. But this is Trace Cooper. He's the mayor of Atlantic Beach. And they had a bike ped plan, but they knew that they were not going to be able to afford signage for two to three years. And so, he was like, we want to do something now. We want to organize and do something now. And so he reached out. His, uh, his chief planner created a whole campaign of about 70 signs, and they deployed them in a matter of three weeks. 
And he was amazed at how simple and easy it was. And you know that just juxtaposed to a million dollar campaign that takes three years to produce. And that's when I kind of realized why so many people across the country and even the globe are starting to listen to some of these more tactical urbanism, DIY planning projects, is because this approach, this kind of ground up um, user generated approach is starting to fill a void. And when it starts, when this approach pairs with the quick development and accessibility of technology, it's starting to change the way that we do things. It's starting to change the way that a city can provide services to its citizens, that a city can learn from its citizens. And so that's what really got me excited. And so other communities started to create these. This is Mount Hope, West Virginia. It's a 1,500 person mining town. They've never been able to afford, afford signage. They never will. 12 community members got together. They had, a, they had a public meeting. They designed the whole campaign and installed it. This is the mayor on the right and then his grandson on the left. It was really exciting. They invited me out there to kind of just take it all in. Communities actually even started crowdfunding for campaigns. This was in Greensboro. So what I had once crowdfunded, people were crowdfunding to use it, which was pretty awesome. And I got to meet people like Judy. It was uh, all of the different types, again, the different types of people that were coming out to do this. You know, she wasn't an urbanist. She was just an engaged stakeholder in downtown who cared about creating a healthy, safe place for people to kind of thrive in her city. So at about this point, and this is you know, fairly recent, this is over the last six to eight months, I've really started to listen and observe how technology is influencing our future cities. And walkability is becoming a huge, huge factor in the future of our cities and how we live and how we make choices and how we are healthy. And as obesity is at, at its highest point now, you know, walkability is a huge critical focus for all cities, all communities, all over the country and all over the globe. Um, I was at this event in New York and Michael Bloomberg uh, keynoted it and that's all he talked about. That's all he talked about. Now he's in New York, but it's, I mean, he has a global influence. And so it was really exciting to see how many people are talking about all of these little systems um, and pathways that are so integral to maintaining a healthy, safe place. <clears throat> And so just some figures that I've started to come across that kind of show how things have changed over the last 50 or 60 years is in 1960, one in four people took one useful 10 minute walk a day. In 2010, one in 10 did. So it went from 25% of the population to 10% of the population. Yet, 41% of uh, trips in a car every day are less than a 20 minute walk. So when you start to think about numbers like that, it's, it's kind of it's crazy. And I've started to try and wrap my head around more of these problems. And it's how, what is walkability? It's infrastructure, it's culture, it's political will. And for so long, the only real response to behavior has been infrastructure. Build sidewalks, build bike lanes, and then people will use it. But I'm convinced that society and kind of culture is moving faster than that. It's moving a lot faster than that. And that's where projects like Parklets and Walk Raleigh, um, which has now turned into Walk Your City, and other projects <laughs> are really starting to kind of shift the way that people think about their space and support different types of projects going forward. So what I'm really focused on is the culture. I'm really focused on shifting the perception of how people want to invest in space and, and choose to live in space. Um, to, to make it a little bit easy for the political will to invest in better infrastructure that allows for more choice. And so this is a map of where all the signs have been created over the past eight months. We launched a beta and then kind of opened it up and it was so exciting. It was six continents, we're close to 50 countries now. And I, I mean, I never thought that this would happen. It was, it was so inspiring to see so many people wanting to take action through this really, really simple platform which has, again, moved us down this road, moved us down this, this rabbit hole. I never, ever would have thought that a year after I started to plan uh, some of these campaigns with cities that I'd still be doing it and that it looks like I'll be doing it for at least another year and that I'd be evolving what this technology is. I've had to force myself to learn what technology is and, and how to plan it and how to 
work with developers. And so we're really excited to be evolving. This is kind of just some wireframes as to where we're going next. We're starting to create a little bit more um, management on the back end to kind of organize campaigns, to track analytics, to make it more accessible, and to allow sponsors to come on board. And I guess this has kind of gotten me to the point where, um, <laughs> where I, I've kind of had to learn a lot about the tech community. I never thought while I was in school that I'd start to learn about the tech community, but it's really interesting how tech is starting to influence our physical space. I was very skeptical for a long time, but over the past six months, I've made it my goal to learn more and more about all of these different widgets and apps and applications that are changing the way that we interact. And I wanted to just talk about a few of those that are, that are really interesting to me and that I think are going to change things in a big way over the next 6, 12, and 24 months. Um, so bike share, I think a lot of people have heard about bike share where you can kind of hop on a bike and go from point A to point B. Usually the first half hour is free. Um, this is actually renting cars. That, this is car to go. There's a lot of different models, but there's car share, ride share. Um, this is in Austin, car to go, where you actually pay per minute. And you can drop it off and pick it up just within basically a geographic fence, which is so wild to think about. Um, Lyft and Uber are basically on-demand drivers, on-demand cabs. Lyft is actually citizens using their own cars. And then Uber is professional drivers. How, just for a raise of hands, how many people have heard of Uber? All right. I asked that question Wednesday night at the College of Design, and, and pretty much no one had heard of it. So it's, it's really interesting to see the, the difference. But uh, I think that things like this are going to have a huge impact on the way that we start to shape our public spaces and the way that we allocate space. Um, and then on the other side is, is these platforms to help people connect. Code for America brings fellows together and teams them with municipal governments to uh, help solve problems and build out software that they can use. IOBI is actually a crowdfunding site like Kickstarter, but it's for environmental projects and community projects. And Neighborland actually originated from those original red stickers um, that was on a previous slide, and it's ways for people to suggest ideas for their city and then other people to jump on board and help take action. But I've realized that I've kind of, sometimes I drink a little bit too much of the Kool-Aid, and I always want to come back to ground myself. And I have to remind myself that I do like to create, I do like to challenge myself, I like to tinker and play and experiment. And so I, I feel like I had to talk about Ra the Raleigh Beach um, because it's all these other little projects that I like to do on the side and team up with people to do to, again, continue to shift perceptions about place, about space, about the way that people take things in. And I love to be curious. I love to explore. I love discovery. And I love to create that experience for people. And so, um, so that's also why I wanted to talk about my love for gnomes. Um, I don't know how many people are familiar with Easter eggs that are on websites, but a lot of times developers will build in these fun little things that you'll find, like if you're just cruising around, like on MailChimp, for instance, which is an email client, if you type boredom into the search uh, category and you hit enter, the, s the screen turns into space invaders. And, and you can shoot all the little buttons apart. And so little things like that are built in. And I, I, I love that. I love that, I, that idea, that sense of discovery and creation and, um, and, and curiosity. And so, so we actually created one for Walk Your City. And so it's a gnome. I think that gnomes represent a lot. Um, I really became fond of them actually in Copenhagen as well. They were a big part of that culture. It was about discovery and experience and cur cur curiosity. And so this is our physical, our physical Easter egg. And so funny enough, with perfect timing, um, you know, that's him in his, in his natural habitat. Um, <laughs> he can really go anywhere, but he usually needs a ledge or a corner, and he doesn't like to be in the total public. He likes to kind of be in corners or in nooks. Um, and, uh, and funny enough, uh, my wonderful fiance and I put one right outside of our apartment building downtown. And just Wednesday, someone was walking by and got a glimpse of it. And she happened to take a twit pic of it on Twitter and then call out New Raleigh and say, hey, New Raleigh, what's this gnome in downtown Raleigh? And so it's like that, that right there was, perfect, I think, a perfect example of like what this represents to me. It's about this idea that as you're walking, like 
when you take the time to kind of experience place and enjoy public space, you never know what you might find. And so it's my goal to kind of, as tech-oriented as I get and as things go on, I always try and re remain curious um, and explore the unknown. And so I actually brought a whole bunch of these. And if you're willing to go out and place them around Raleigh, I'm willing to give as many out as you want. So, um, so it's, it's a little bit of a, of a uh, homework assignment. Um, and with that, stay curious, explore the unknown, and questions. Awesome.